Hello, Bravs. We're back with Clarice Lispector's Near to the Wild Heart, Chapter 13, Otavio's Encounter. The dark, murky night was cut in half, separated into two somber blocks of sleep. Where was she? Between the two halves, seeing them, the half she had already slept and the half she still had to sleep, isolated in the timeless and in the spaceless, in an empty gap. The interval would be discounted from years of life. The ceiling and the walls joined up without any edges, silent with folded arms, and she found herself inside a cocoon. Joanna looked at it without thinking, without feeling, one thing looking at another, little by little, just by moving her leg. Awareness loomed in the distance, mingled with the taste of sleep in her mouth spreading then pervading her entire body. The moonlight sent a pale glow over the bed, over the room, the bed. One moment, one more moment, one more moment, one more moment. Suddenly, like a tiny ray, something lit up inside her and rapidly without moving a single facial muscle, looked sideways. She continued to stare at the ceiling without the slightest interest, but her heart was beating furiously, looked sideways. She could see that she would end up looking, had a vague idea of what was there at her side, but she behaved as if she had no intention of looking, as if she were ignoring the rest of the bed, looked sideways, then defeated before the multitude of faces watching the scene from up there on the stage. She slowly turned her head on the pillow and looked. There was a man there. She realized that this was precisely what she had been expecting. His chest was bare, his arms extended crucified. She turned her head away again. Well, now I've looked, but almost immediately she raised her body and resting on one elbow, she stared at him, perhaps without curiosity, but demanding, waiting for a reply, or mindful that those impassive faces were waiting for that gesture. There was a man there. Who was he? The question surfaced quietly, was already lost. Swept away like an unfortunate leaf by the dark waves. But before Joanna could altogether forget the question, she saw it become more urgent, pose itself with renewed insistence, its voice whispering in her ear, Who was he? She grew impatient, weary of that multitude of faces which no longer which was no longer a game she could control, but now making demands now making demands. Who was he? A man? A male, she replied. But that stranger was her man. She looked into his face, the languid face of a sleeping child, the lips slightly parted, the pupils under those thick, lowered eyelids turned inwards, dead. She touched him gently on the shoulder, and before getting any reaction, she drew back instantly terrified. She paused for a moment, listening to her own heart beating in her breast. She adjusted her nightdress, giving herself time to withdraw should she still want to. However, she carried on. She brought her pale arm close to the naked arm of, the hum of that human being, and although she had already foreseen the thought that followed, she trembled, struck by the glaring difference in color, as firm and audacious as a scream. There were two bodies outlined on the bed, and this time she couldn't complain of having led herself unknowingly to tragedy. The thought had imposed itself without her having chosen it. And suppose he were to wake up and find her leaning over him? If he should suddenly open his eyes, they would meet hers. Two lights crossing with another two lights. She withdrew rapidly, cowered within herself, overcome with fear, that unconfessed dread of former nights without rain, in the dark without sleep. How often must I experience the same things in different situations? She imagined those eyes as two copper discs, shining without expression. What voice might come from that slumbering throat? Sounds like thick arrows, quietly embedding themselves in the furniture, in the walls, in her, and once again, all with folded arms, staring into remote space, implacably. The chimes of the clock only finish when they finish. There is nothing to be done. 
or one throws a stone at it, and the noise of broken glass and springs is followed by silence spreading within like blood. Why not kill the man? Nonsense. That thought was completely fabricated. She looked at him, afraid that all that, like pressing a button, you only had to touch it, would start working noisily, mechanically, filling the room with live movements and sounds. She was afraid of her own fear, which left her isolated. She could see herself from afar, from the top of the extinguished lamp, lost and puny, covered with moonbeams, beside the man who might come to life at any moment. And suddenly, disloyally, she experienced real fear, as li live as any living thing. The mystery lurking in that animal who was hers, in that man whom she had only known how to love. Fear in her body, fear in her blood. Perhaps he might strangle her, kill her. Why not? She was frightened, the audacity with which her own thoughts rushed on, guiding her like a tiny beam, mobile and tremulous, through the dark, where was she heading? But why should Otavio not strangle her? Were they not alone? And suppose he were mad beneath his sleep, she trembled. Her legs moved involuntarily. She drew back the sheets, ready to defend herself, to escape. Ah, uh, if she were to cry out, she would not be afraid. Fear would vanish with the scream. Otavio responded to her movements, raising his eyebrows in turn, compressing his lips, parting them once more and going on being dead. She watched him, watched him, and waited. There was still silence, the same silence. Perhaps, who knows, she might have experienced moments of dreaming, merged with reality, she thought to herself. She tried to remember how the day had passed. Nothing of any importance except Otavio's note letting her know that he would be lunching out, something he had been doing almost regularly for quite some time now, or had her fear been more than hallucination? The room was now bright and cold. She rested with her eyes closed. Happily, there were few nights when she had nightmares. How foolish she had been. She brought her hand close, tried to touch him. She placed her outstretched palm on his chest, gently to begin with, almost wavering, but gradually overcoming her fear, then growing more confident with every minute that passed. She abandoned herself completely over that broad field sparsely covered with vegetation, her eyes wide open yet seeing nothing, all her attention focused on herself and on what she was feeling. Some furniture creaked, the shadows fastened more firmly onto the wardrobe. Then an idea occurred to her, an idea so passionate that her heart accompanied it at a furious tempo. Like this, she drew near to him, gently nestled her head in his arm, close to his chest. She remained still, waiting. Little by little, she could feel the stranger's warmth on the nape of her neck. She could hear the rhythmic beating of a heart, remote and earnest. She examined herself attentively. That living creature was hers. That unknown man, that other world was hers. She saw him from afar, from the top of the lamp, his naked body, lost and weak, weak, how fragile and delicate those exposed lines were, unprotected. He, he, the man. From some hidden source, anguish traveled up through her body, filling all her cells, pushing her defenseless to the foot of the bed. My God, my God. Afterwards, in painful childbirth, beneath that labored breathing, she could feel the comforting oil of renunciation spilling inside her. At last, at last, he was hers. She wanted to call him, to plead his support, to beg him to speak words of appeasement, but she had no desire to awaken him. She feared that he might not know how to make her ascend onto a higher plane of feeling in order to achieve what was still no more than a sweet embryo. She knew that even at this very moment she was alone, that the man would awaken in some remote place, that he would be able to intercept her with some obstacle, a distracted and indifferent word on the narrow and luminous path where she was taking her first tottering steps. Meanwhile, to imagine that he ignored what was happening inside her did not lessen her affection. It redoubled it, made it greater than her body and soul, as if to compensate for the man's remoteness. 
Joanna smiled, but she could not avoid the suffering that began to throb throughout her entire body like some bitter thirst. More than suffering, a craving for love swelling and overwhelming her, caught up in a light, hazy maelstrom like sudden vertigo. She became conscious of the world, of her own life, of the past from beyond her birth, of the future beyond her body. Yes, lost like a point, a point without dimensions, once a thought. She had been born, she would die, the earth, a fleeting, intense sensation, a blind immersion into a color, crimson, tranquil, and expansive as a field, the same violent, instantaneous awareness that sometimes assailed her in great moments of love, like a drowning man who is seen for the last time. My, she began in a low voice, but all that she might say was not enough. She was living, living. She watched him, how he slept, how he existed. She had never been so aware of him before. When she had made love to him during those first months of their marriage, she had been fascinated to discover her own body. The renewal had been hers. She had not given herself rapturously to this man and had remained isolated. Now suddenly she understood that love could make one desire the moment that comes in that impulse, which is life. She could feel the world gently throbbing in her breast. Her body ached as if she were bearing the femininity of all women. She fell silent once more, peering into herself. She remembered, I am the tiny wave that has no other re region except the sea. I tussle with myself, I glide, I fly, laughing, giving, sleeping, but alas, always within myself, always within myself. Since when? Sometime, something I read as a child, thought, suddenly she remembered she had thought of it just now, perhaps before placing her arm on that of Otavio, perhaps at that moment when she had felt like screaming, Everything was incredibly, increasingly in the past, and the past was as mysterious as the future. Yes, and it had also come as fast as the silent car out of control. The man she sometimes met in the street, that man who stared at her silent, thin, and, <clears throat> and as sharp as a knife. She had already felt it vaguely that night, leaning on her conscience like the point of a needle, like a premonition. But at what moment? In her dream? During her vigil? A new flux of pain and life began to swell and inundate her with the anguish of being imprisoned. I, she began timidly addressing Otavio. It was getting darker. She couldn't see him except as a shadow. He became more and more blurred, slipped through her hands, lay dead in the depth of her sleep. And she, solitary as the ticking of a clock in an empty house, she waited, seated on the bed, wide-eyed, the chill of approaching dawn penetrating her flimsy nightdress. Alone in the world, crushed by the excess of life, listening to the blare of music, much too loud for any human being. But release came, and Joanna trembled at its impulse. Because gentle and sweet as daybreak in a forest, inspiration came. Then she invented what she must say, her eyes closed, submissive, she uttered in a whisper words born at that moment, hitherto unheard, still tender from creation, new and fragile buds. They were less than words, merely disconnected syllables, meaningless, lukewarm, that flowed and crisscrossed, fertilized, were reborn in a single being, only to separate immediately, breathing, breathing, her eyes moistened with sweet happiness and gratitude. She had spoken. The words preceding language itself, from its source, its very source. She went up to him, giving him her soul, while feeling sated as if she had absorbed the world. She was like a woman. The somber trees and the garden secretly guarded the silence. She knew. She knew. She fell asleep. And I'm about to as well. Probably two thirds of the way through the book, and the next chapter is Lydia. It's not the one that Otavio's having the affair with. All right, goodbye, bro. Goodbye.